You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn soybeans and more with so many tradable products the futures options market can be an intimidating place how can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products don't worry we've got you covered welcome to this week in futures options the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace each week we'll break down the top trades hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. So be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, the show where we break down everything that's going on on the other side of the fence. So your commodities, your metals, and these days, a lot of equities as well. Go figure. A lot happening in that side of the fence as well. My name is Mark Longo from The Options, a brand spanking new, theoptionsinsider.com. If you haven't been over there in a little while, check it out. All sorts of new fun stuff going on over there as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. You guys can join us live on this show every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, or after the fact, on your device of choice. We don't judge. Just send us those questions, those comments, those pearls of wisdom. We do enjoy hearing from you guys. Speaking of hearing from people... We got a twofer of guests joining us in the studio today, listeners. I'm pleased to be joined first off by our old friend coming back on after traveling the globe hither and yon. This time, unfortunately, without delicious burgers. Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there in the land of Footsie Russell. Mr. Smith, welcome back to the studio, even if you come not bearing delicious gifts. You know, I, I mentioned when I walked in here, you've lost, like, some weight, Mark. because <laughs> so, you haven't been here in a while. <laughs> and uh, that was the response. I haven't been showing up with burgers. I, I like the correlation. So but maybe, uh, maybe there is something to it. You're contributing to my health, if not to my taste buds. Well, thanks for having me back. It's always fantastic to be here. And it's an appropriate time to be talking Russell. <laughs> Who knew? The dog days of summer. Hot times for the equity market. Who would have guessed it? So we're also joined doing a double down on the Russell today with an old friend of the program. He has to be on in a little while as well. Mr. Rick Rosenthal, the director of business development for FTSE Russell Indices over there at the SIBO. Rick, welcome back to the program to you as well. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And uh, we just walked over and saw the uh, Blue Angels yes. practicing their... <laughs> So listen, if, you hear, if you hear if you hear strafing and the sounds of uh, attack runs in the distance, don't worry. Chicago not being invaded is just our annual ear and water show going. Luckily, we're in the depths 
of an old Burnham turn of the last century building. So you shouldn't hear too much. Just in case. Don't get worried. We're safe. We're safe and sound in here. But Rick, you know what's not safe and sound are these markets. They are anything but. Pretty much since the last time you've been on, it has been a topsy-turvy roller coaster out there in the equities. This week, we saw one of the biggest rallies of the year, followed almost immediately by one of the worst sell-offs of the year on fears of German recession and Chinese economic weakness and a yield curve inversion here in the U.S. So that one, two, three punch really hammered the markets yesterday, the worst sell-offs of the year. Today, it seems like people are struggling to find their footing. We were selling off. We were mixed. Then the things were rallying. Now coming off again, markets are selling off to slightly mixed again. Dow up, rest of the indices off ever so slightly. So these are uncharacteristically turbulent times for the middle of August, which brings me around, Rick, to it's been a little while since you've joined us. I'm sure things have been kind of hot and heavy in your neck of the woods since the last time you've been on. So what's been lighting up your tape in the midst of all this over there, Rick? What are clients asking you about? What are you seeing uh, on the Russell side from, from your perspective these days? You know, it's interesting. It was only a few weeks ago, back in late July, when the, uh, the market was making record highs. You know, the S&P made a record high on July 26th. And then uh, July 31st, the Fed uh, cut the uh, Fed funds rate. And so uh, I think the market's reacting to a lot of things. It's reacting to, you know, Trump's uh, tweets about the China tariff, uh, the inverted yield curve, uh, the, the, uh, the amount of uh, debt that's uh, earning negative rates. I wouldn't say earning, but paying negative rates. So uh, this is all uh, headline news, and the market is uh, gyrating, and I would say the market rallies – uh, and has a lifespan of a fruit fly. So uh, these are interesting times because the headlines seem to drive the market and has uh, quite an impact. Uh, but yet the backdrop is you look at the U.S. economy and it's still chugging along. Corporate earnings have been pretty good. So in the world of, of Russell, uh, which is near and dear to all of us here, uh, the Russell 2000 has been underperforming the large caps so far year to date. Um, some of that has to do with the small caps you would think would uh, respond favorably to lowering interest rates, but the reality is many of them are leveraged. And so it turns out that uh, a good portion, maybe 25 percent thereabouts, um, have negative earnings. So it's been underperforming relative to the large caps. However, if you look at the, uh, the correlation between the Russell and the S&P 500, it's pretty high. And so uh, there are opportunities here. There's opportunities to trade uh, volatility in one versus volatility in the other. And uh, there's been some interesting uh, activity this week looking at the implied volatility of the Russell 2000 relative to uh, VIX. So, Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'll, I'll get to that spread in a second because Sean and I always cover that uh, whenever he's on the show. But, you know, you mentioned kind of that – that bit of a dichotomy we're seeing between the Russell and the rest of the broad indices, obviously between small cap and large cap. There was an interesting narrative going into this trade war that, you know, Russell would maybe perform one way, and then we saw it perform a little bit differently. And that's been interesting, I think, for a lot of people out there watching this space. When you're not talking to me, you're out there, you know, interacting with a lot of the clients and the large institutional users of Russell. What are you hearing from them on this point? Is that driving more volume from them as a result? Do they like this dichotomy, this divergence between the two? Is it the fact that it's not maybe performing as they thought? Is that causing them to trade less? What what are you hearing from these people in these topsy-turvy times? Sure. So we are seeing more activity in the Russell. Actually, the, the volume has picked up considerably over the past couple of weeks as a result of the increased volatility. Um, so in terms of participants, we've got um, some hedge funds that are putting on some iron condors. Uh, they're harvesting volatility that way. Uh, we've got some traders that uh, look at putting on uh, a position with a vertical. Um, they have an opinion on market direction. Uh, a cost-effective way to express that view is buying a vertical call or buying a vertical put. Uh, get a nice return on, on capital that way, and you have some limited uh, you know, risk. So... Um, I would say most of the trades that we are seeing are directional type trades with verticals, or they're uh, they're putting on straddles to uh, play uh, volatility. Iron condors in the Russell, I like it. I like it. Are you seeing the same kind of things out there, Sean? As these funds are coming in and maybe utilizing next level, shall we say? Let's call it one hundred and two type strategies in Russell land. Absolutely. Um, 
these types of uh, trading strategies are um, definitely increasing. Um, this increased volatility in both SPX, uh, VIX, and RVX uh, as that spread tightens and then widens is an opportunity to, to trade one pr- product versus the other. Um, and, you know, Russell volume has picked up over the last few weeks, and it's, uh, it's very exciting to see. Um, but, yeah, when, when these markets rock, you know, small, the small cap index does move quite a bit, and it's, uh, it's an opportunity to put those trades on. To add to this point, I would say RVX is typically 300 basis points above VIX. So when you see uh, movement uh, in the market, particularly a, a sharp down move, VIX spikes. And we've seen this week uh, the, that spread between RVX and VIX collapse which is a, a great opportunity for those who want to play mean reversion. So, um, you know, you could trade one straddle versus another straddle, uh, taking advantage of the, the spike move in VIX, selling volatility in VIX and buying volatility in RVX for mean reversion. Yeah, you know, looking at that right now, uh, you're right. There has been something we've been watching, the spread kind of ebb and flow over the past few weeks. And right now it is, as you mentioned, contracting. We're seeing coming into showtime, we saw VIX at around right around a 2160 or so. That volatility of VIX, which is always a key indicator, at about a 113, so getting extremely bid up. That's up 13 from last show. The VIX up four points from last show. The RVX, so the Russell VIX, up about three and a half points from last show, 24 and a quarter. So again, talking about that spread coming in a little bit. It was about three points last week. This week, it's about 2.65, so coming in a lot tighter. And, you know, Sean, I remember when your predecessor over there in that seat back in the days when Pat used to be over there, he used to always come on our volatility show and point out when that spread would start tightening it up, when, when RVX was, was still tradable back in the good old days. Whenever it got really tight or really wide, that's when they saw huge upswell of interest in spreading between the two. I'm, I'm assuming now, Rick, from hearing what you're saying out here, that we're starting to see that interest again as it started to get a little bit tighter. We're starting to see people out there who obviously like to, to R between the two indices and just in general track Russell Vol versus large cap Vol. That these are the moments they're starting to light it up again, Rick. Sure. And not only that, but for those who are looking for volatility risk premium, they're looking at the difference between the implied volatility and the subs- subsequent twenty day. Um, there's opportunities to uh, sell calls, uh, sell cash secured puts. Um, this is a very good way to again, um, if you have a position in the Russell two thousand and you want to uh, harvest volatility, uh, if you look at the 30 delta buy right and the buy right performance relative to the Russell 2000 year to date, actually the 30 delta buy right has outperformed the Russell 2000. So uh, for, for endowments or pension funds who are looking to enhance their returns, this is one way they do that. They, they can systematically sell calls. Um, and we're now starting to see more activity from some of the 40 Act funds that are getting more involved in the space. Um, so um, another interesting thing, the flex options has actually picked up in, in Russell. So we're seeing increasing open interest in flex options. So longer term, more institutionally sized people who who don't want to play in the standard months, Rick. They want to, they want to have their own. Uh... I, was ho- I was hoping you could just talk a little bit more about flex and how, how customers could actually trade those. Sure. So a flex option um, allows the customer to customize uh, the trade. Uh, so, for example, you can adjust the date, uh, expiration date. You can adjust the, uh, uh, for those who want American or European, they have the choice. Uh, it allows more flexibility. So oftentimes a flex option is used for going further out. Uh, we see a lot of trades uh, that occur in the nearby months. We have weeklies that expire every week. Uh, we have standards that expire every uh, third Friday. Flex options are typically used for going out a year or more. So we're starting to see more activity in that. Now I'm going to cheat since you mentioned the premium harvesting. Sean, we've talked about this before. We have some listeners who keep writing in about those, including this one guy here, Dorn, too. I think he wrote in a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'll give him a chance. I'm going to cheat and bump up a listener question now. Uh, but he wants to know, any updates on the premium harvesting strategies 
in the Russell 2000 right now. He wants to know, is put selling still the way to go? Well, he kind of just gave us that, Rick. It sounds like that uh, that 30 Delta put is outperforming. Have you guys done any other updates to those strategies? Maybe any other interesting findings or takeaways you want to share with our audience on those? Because they do keep writing in every now and then asking about those. And I, I always make poor Sean have to do it. But these are your babies here, Rick. So I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you answer instead. So SIBO has created a number of strategy benchmark indexes. And each one has a ticker. So we have uh, actually uh, commissioned some uh, studies to analyze the performance of these hypothetical positions over a period of, let's say, 16 years. And so uh, Russell 2000 has a buy right, a 30 delta buy right, a put right. Um, We've got a zero cost put spread collar. um, And you were asking performance. It really depends on how you time slice so year to date, the buy right and the 30 delta buy right has actually outperformed the put right. So uh, for those who are looking for an opportunity to harvest premium, um, you know, a good way to do that is uh, putting on a buy right or 30 delta buy right uh, when the market is either trending sideways or moving up gradually. So you can obviously construct those yourselves, listeners, or if you want it just to set it and forget it, those indices will allow you to harvest. I know you all love to harvest the risk premium, to harvest that for yourself. Speaking of what you're up to out here, let's look and take a quick check here. What's lighting up this week over there on uh, on the Globex for all things Russell? Seems like, Sean, the order of the day, go figure. This has kind of been the case for a while out here. We're at, coming into showtime, 1458 out here in the Russell. So we're off again this week, off about 36 Percent vol. I want to tell you, we just talked about it, is up, <laughs> up substantially over the week. And it seems like uh, we talked about this before, Sean, kind of far out of the money puts. Not, not that far anymore. 1390 seemed like a lot farther out of the money last week than it does now. But 1390 puts seem to be the order of the day. I guess nothing too surprising there, Sean. We see a big sell off. And uh, Rick was just mentioning iron condors and things. It seems like in the, in the broad Russell options here on CME. People just want to get the protection again. Is that that's pretty much not surprising? Is that what you expected as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, uh, funds funds out there want to uh, protect the downside, and there's there's that other side of the trade where that there's that opportunity to harvest volatility when it pops. And we've we've talked to several fund managers along our travel days, Rick and I, and we've asked the question like. You keep selling vol. What do you do when vol like really pops? And th- their response is, "We sell more." <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So there's uh, there, there's always uh, someone out there that's looking to harvest volatility, but there's that other side of the trade for the protection, which is uh, something I I've lived my entire options trading life. You love selling it for a quarter. You gotta love selling it for a buck, right? That's just how it works. Right? Exactly. <laughs> there's nothing bad could come from that. So looking here, just catching up on the skew here. Again, September was the most active month out here. And looking at it, no, go figure, puts getting nice and rich here this week. The puts were 15.9% rich to the at the money. This week, 18 and a half. So coming up almost three points in the calls Getting cheaper, again, as you'd figure, 13.3% cheat the other way this week, 15%. So pretty much as you'd expect out there in terms of skew and options activity. Speaking of activity, uh, Sean, these, these minis, uh, they are the micro options, not even minis, micros. I apologize. These micros, they continue to light it up. Another day, a new, another record for these micro e-mini futures. Just this morning, the CME was uh, sending out here uh, that they've hit. It's 100 days now. doesn't seem like that long ago, Sean, that you and I were sitting down with Tim in Boca to discuss the pending, the upcoming launch of these futures. Here it is, already 100 days, and looking at the numbers, yeah, they say by far and away, in terms of contract volume, the most successful product CME has ever launched, Thirty-eight over 38 million contracts to date, 550,000 ADV, the Russell 2.1 million going up out there so far, just in these E-minis, so I got to imagine this has been, I know you were looking forward to it for a while, Sean. I got to imagine this, is, this has been quite a little feather in your cap watching these numbers go up here, particularly during earnings season. Definitely uh, fun to watch. The volumes have been tr- tremendous. Um, something to, to look at is the volumes in the uh, minis, which are just a little bigger, um, have exploded as well, um, north of a couple hundred thousand contracts in the last uh, couple of weeks as well on a daily daily basis. And uh, the other strong indicator is their open interest has re- also remained strong and is growing. So, um, yeah, my hat's off to Tim McCourt and company. They, they've done a tremendous job um, trading these. And then, 
you know, from the from the CBOE product side, these futures really allow an options trader to surgically enhance that delta, uh, so they can really trade that delta down to a, a much more uh, surgical size. Uh, so you've got options traders uh, and customers coming from SIBO that uh, are benefiting from these products as well. It's just it's all good growing the the Russell franchise in pie. Well, Rick, we have some more questions about about Russell. Come to in a little bit, but we're, we're going to dive into some other products. But before we do, any other thoughts you want to you want to share with us on all things Russell before we before we come back to some listener questions in a little bit? A couple things. Uh, first, uh, earlier this week, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs put out a call to their clients saying, if you want to get long the market, buy S and P calls. I say buy Russell calls. <laughs> Russell calls are a good way to, to get along the market. That's I'm one. that motion. Secondly, um, there's a lot of technicians looking at support resistance levels, and we recently took out a, a support level in both the S&P and, and Russell. Um, th- if, you're, if you're a swing trader, um, there's a number of ways to express a view if you think the market's going up or down. I would take a, a good look at... Uh, using verticals as a way to express that view, um, in it, so I would if you're if you're not looking at verticals, I would encourage you to to do that. And that's uh, buying uh, if you're long the market. You want to get long the market. You buy a uh, a call at one strike and you sell the another strike above that. If you think the market's going to go down, you buy a, a put uh, and sell another put at a lower strike. So take a look at those. Well, we certainly can get behind uh, talking verticals here. We're not big on the outrights. We like verticals, a little bit of a risk-mitigated, premium-mitigated strategy, so I could certainly get behind that. So, yeah, whether you, if you want bullish exposure, whether you're looking large cap, or maybe, as, as Rick and Sean suggest, maybe, maybe you like a little small cap. Small cap has been beaten up a little bit lately, so maybe, maybe that's attractive to you. Either way, uh, we got some questions from you guys coming up. Rick, I save all the Russell stuff <laughs> for when you come back on the show, so we, we got some for you in a little bit. Meanwhile, we're going to roll right on into other things that are lighting us this week. Let's do a quick rundown of the top movers and shakers here on Globex here for CME this week. Just in general across the board, the top five here. A biggest move to the upside actually is NatGas, nearly 6%, 5.7%, followed by the ultra U.S. bond there for up 4.5%. WTI, old friend number three, up nearly 4%. Euro Eurodollar, 3.6%. And then the 30-year, up 2.5%. To the downside, we've got uh, wheat down 4.8%. And then number five, number four is uh, iron ore. Our old friend iron ore talked about it last week, six and a third percent. Number three there is live cattle, another one, about seven, almost 7.7 percent. Then the good old Arbob, number two, off eight and a quarter. Number one with the bullet to the downside, not a place you really want to be, is corn off over 11 percent, 11.36 percent. So I got a feeling we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first off, let's roll on into our old friend here. Uh, you guys all. You write about it. You want to know about it every week. You got questions about it again this week. It's uh, WTI. Yeah, taking a drubbing yet again today with all this uncertainty in the market. Off about, not quite a full handle, but close to it, down to 54 and a third or so. Off nearly 2% today. That's on the heels of it falling sharply yesterday on Wednesday. Of course, we all know what happened yesterday. That kind of one, two, three punch of weak data coming out of China and Germany on top of some uh, surprising Crude oil inventory surpluses here in the U.S., all of that really took the wind out of any crude bulls uh, sales out there. It fell more than 5% yesterday. That's after having another big up day the day before. So it's kind of like, like the equity markets of late. It rallies hard. It sells off hard. And these days we're still kind of down. Net on the week now. Here we are almost unched. 54.19 on WTI coming in off about a third of a percent net on the week, listeners. So all this Sturm und Drang, we got not a lot to show for it net here on the week. Again, a lot of that driven also by the, the surprise crude build the API reported on Tuesday. So a lot, a lot going on out here in the crude market. Let's see what was lighting it up out here from an options perspective. It looks like number one with the bullet out here. Go figure. People are concerned about. All things, uh, all things downside. So they, and they like their even numbers out here as well. So they're diving in to all things October out here. The Oct 50 puts lighting it up, number one with a bullet, doing nearly 13,000 contracts. All, over half of the volume this week coming in that Oct contract as well. A vol up again across the board, not surprisingly given all this turbulence out there. Vol creeping up, not a, not a huge amount, but enough, about two points or so in that October handle. Let's look here really quickly. 50 puts 
were leading the dance. What was coming behind those? Then we've got, oh, very close, hot on his heels, were the 45 puts <laughs> uh, doing the lion's share. 6,700 of that 12,147 came on Tuesday, so over half, and the rest kind of evenly scattered throughout the week. The lion's share for 50 puts coming on Wednesday, 5,200 of those there. Then they got 55 puts, a nice little put strip here, doing 9,000 of those. And then don't worry, there were some calls as well. Uh, 7,800 and 7,700 of the 60 calls and the double calls, respectively. Again, all of that out there in October. Let's go a little bit farther out to see if any other esoteric paper lighting it up. The 70 calls doing 1,000 contracts out here in March of 2020. Beyond that, not a lot really lighting it up. I know you guys all have questions about the SKU, so let's pull it up here. In that active OC contract, it's got a little over a month to go here. And the SKU, let's see, last week, the puts were leading the dance. They were ten and a half percent cheap, or excuse me, rich to the at the money. This week they've come in. Uh, they come in quite a bit. They're seven point eight percent rich. So still bid. The, the premium is still to the puts, but it's off uh, oh, almost three per, three points from last week. So a big change. The calls, which is where a lot of you guys like to look, <laughs> they're slightly. I guess you can say slightly firmer than they were last week. They were almost eight percent cheap to the at the money again discount to the calls this week about 6.6 percent cheap so not quite as cheap but still cheap remember we had those market makers on a few weeks ago in the wti crowd saying any pop in wti is their excuse to just dump all the calls they can maybe some of that playing out this week still cheap but not quite as cheap as it was this time last week you mentioned nat gas also lighting it up here it's kind of a bit of an interesting option story out let's pull it up here really quickly and see if we can get the lay of the land out here as we're looking at the energy complex. Remember, you guys can do this for yourselves. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. You do that, you can follow along with all those reports right here, like we're doing right now. You'd see Nat Gas again, you mentioned, it was kind of the leader to the upside here on the week. It was up, oh, about 5, almost 6%, 5.7%. Coming to the showtime, it's still up about 5 and a third percent in that front contract. So a bullish week out here for Nat Gas, up to about two, almost two and a quarter out there in the pricing level for Nat Gas. In terms of where the action is, looks like two puts. We're leading it up, and these are going out in about not quite two weeks, pretty close. So downside puts here were the order of the day in that front contract, doing eleven thousand contract. That's pretty decent volume here for Nat Gas. The lion's share actually coming on Tuesday, nearly five thousand. Of that 11,000 coming on Tuesday and about 3,800 today. So kind of hard to judge OI because a lot of that came today. But of what we saw this week, it was actually slightly closing. So maybe some of these fears abating to the downside. Maybe people taking off some protection either way. Closing paper here on the two puts in Nat Gas. So if all of you write in about Nat Gas, there you go. And, you know, I hate to talk skew in a contract that is a week or two to go. Let's go out, let's go out to October. Give us a little bit more meat on the bone, then we could see what's going on from a skew perspective out here. Uh, the puts were 2.5% rich to the at the money. This week, they're 4.5% rich. The puts getting a little bit bit up. Kind of dovetails what we are just talking about on the put action there. The calls were cheap, 1.3% cheap at the money. This week, a little bit cheaper, 4%. So you move up the skew curve a little bit. Puts get bid. Calls get offered. Not entirely surprising. Maybe the fact that we gapped up, you might think you see a little bit more love to the calls, but it seems like the market is digesting that <laughs> without too much too much concern. You know what? There is concern, though, listeners. You guys are always writing in, asking about ags. Let's hit on it really quickly because, Corn, like you mentioned, number one with a bullet to the downside, taking, I think the technical term is the drubbing uh, this week, off over 11, nearly 12% here. Obviously, a lot of that focusing on a number of different factors. Primarily, we saw maybe a bit of a surprise coming out of the USDA. Everyone has been talking the narrative for U.S planting, of course, listeners, for a while now has been waterlogged, rain-soaked, not enough planting, not enough planting. And yet when the, when the USDA released their su- report on Monday, surprise, surprise, they saw a bigger than expected corn crop. That's in spite of all the bad weather in the Midwest. So guess what? Corn took a dive as a result. Of course, all the weakness in Chinese demand, everything didn't help either. So kind of a bit of a one-two punch. We saw corn futures limit down On Monday, down about 6% before they got halted for a while there. So obviously not a good week for the corn bulls out there, as well as, of course, all the producers and the growers. Uh, USDA expecting 169 bushels of corn per acre. That's up, surprisingly up, 
from 166 in July. Even though he's saying, what about the bad weather? It is still being felt uh, last year was they were expecting 176. So less than last year, but more than was expected. And that was apparently enough to spook the heck out of everybody out here in Cornland. As we come into Showtime listeners, uh, it's at a 361, that front contract off nearly 50 handles or about 12% now. So it is definitely number one percentage-wise to the downside this week, a dubious distinction here for corn. And the lion's share of the action, about a little over a third, almost 37%, uh, coming in that Dece contract here with the number one trade. Go figure. It looks like it's a bit of a tie between the 370 puts here in September and these 400 calls in December, both of them doing about 32,500 contracts exactly. So maybe... A little bit of an interesting bifurcated paper. You think with a big downside move, you'd see it all to in one direction, but that's not apparently the case, which is kind of interesting. With the most of the volume coming in Ds, let's look at the skew out there. Look, by the way, the vol actually off, as you'd expect. I mean, it's a big move to the downside. But remember, A, it's not an equity, so it doesn't automatically have a vol increase when you sell off. And B, they had a big event this Monday. That was where a lot of event premium was priced in. So whenever the event happens, that balloon tends to pop. And even though it was a surprise... Uh, it's still the ball coming in from that event, which is why we're off across the board, including some of these nearer dated contracts off 10 plus points from a vol perspective. And the D's contracts off nearly six points. So big move to the downside in vol as well. In terms of skew, where the action is in this D's contract in corn, it was 5.4% cheap at the money, the puts. This week, they're 12.5% cheap. So reflection some of that vol coming in as well. The calls were 9.6% rich. This week, they are 10.6, so up a point. So people may be interested in or concerned about the upside going into that report. This week, they're getting a little bit more of that upside, which is kind of interesting. So big downside moving corn. You get the skew showing some interesting evolutions as a result. We can keep on rolling, but I also want to mention here that I know we got some questions from you guys on some, uh, on some certain products. So I think without further ado, let's keep on rolling, get into some of your cues with a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options you can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M I X L R.com. All right, everybody. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to your segment. And the whole show is your show, but this is in particular where you guys get to drive the boat here a little bit, steer the old unwieldy bus that is the Twifo program. I already cheated, Rick. I already gave you some a listener question earlier about updates on the premium harvesting strategies, but we got more. I bottle up all the Russell and RVX type questions for when you and Sean are here in the studio, and then I unleash them upon you. So are you ready, Rick? Are you ready for the deluge to begin, sir? Let's go. All right, let's do it. All right, first off, we've got ITM Tim. I'm guessing in the money, Tim. Sean, you're the acronym guy. In the money, Tim. Do you? Uh, you got to be in the money, Tim, right? For our audience, what else could it possibly be? Uh, in the money, Tim. I kind of like that. I kind of like that handle. <laughs> he wants to know: Has RBX ever dipped below VIX? And thanks for such a fun show. Especially enjoyed the recent Hog Love. Well, you're welcome there. We're the only show that does that. Hashtag hog love. When it lights it up every now and then, it is fun to do. Do a sojourn to those esoteric uh, livestock uh, products. But I'll, I'll start you off, Rick. How about that? Because when this question came in, I thought about it. And I knew it had, but I wanted to find the exact date. And it turns out, because obviously they have intersected. And the first time that ever happened, Rick, was on September 10th of 2015. The VIX was at 26 half, 26.51 actually. And RVX dipped to the downside at 26.33. So I did some research into why that was at that time. And ironically enough, it sounds like I took a clip from today. <laughs> it was a hodgepodge of concerns about slowing growth in China and the Federal Reserve's policy inclinations have caused a rift. So it sounds like exactly where we are today. 
<laughs> Rick, what caused that first ever inversion. But you kind of touched on it earlier in the show. RVX, Russell Ball in general tends to have a premium, but obviously that's not always the case. Talk us through some of these these inversions, how often they've maybe occurred, and, and what you see as a result from maybe an activity perspective. So back in September of 2015, I was still in high school. So <laughs> I forgot. You're right. Yeah. Yes. A so, mere pup. So uh, let's, for, let's take a look at what is the volatility index representing. It's the 30-day expected volatility for, it could be, uh, in the case of VIX, the S&P 500, for RVX, it's the Russell 2000. So typically, the small caps in the Russell 2000, being small caps, they uh, have greater price, fluctu- price fluctuation. There's greater inherent price volatility in the Russell 2000. So it's not surprising that the Russell 2000 volatility index will be higher than the VIX on the S&P 500. And as we said earlier, on average, over the past year plus, uh, it's about 3% greater. Uh, So uh, it is unusual when you see the VIX at a premium to RVX. And typically this happens when there's a sharp move in volatility. And the, it's market dynamics. It could be related to the volatility ETF products. It could be related to um, SPX is the proxy for risk on, risk off. And so there's uh, a lot of hedging, a lot of you know, panic buying that, that goes on and buying puts in, the, in SPX. But anyways, so typically these are panic moves and they're short-lived. So when you're trading one volatility versus another, uh, it's, it's a mean reversion type trade. When you see those uh, disallocations, it's a nice way to, uh, when VIX is trading at a premium to uh, RVX, it's a good way to, to uh, take advantage of that dislocation by uh, selling VIX and buying RVX. Yeah, and that certainly seems to be uh, the point when a lot of interest perks up. Sean, any thoughts on this for our listeners here? Mr. The Creatively Named In The Money Tim? I get uh, I get this question every time I'm on the show, VIX versus RVX. <laughs> yeah, and, it's and kind of an ongoing theme of ours here. And the, the question is always, well, there's not a VIX, uh, RVX future, so how could I actually take advantage of this trade? And um, you do that in the options. You do that in the rut options. And uh, I can let Rick talk, to you, uh, talk through that with you if you'd like. But uh, I think I always mention Rick Rosenthal and his email address, and I point people to him all the time. Well, but uh, You asked me to give out my phone number. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I will I, give out my email you can address. Actually trade, you can actually trade SPX options versus rut options or the VIX versus rut options as well to, sure. to, to uh, take advantage of that trade. Yeah, I mean, yeah, both both products are very liquid, um, so we don't trade it as a spread per se. But you could put on a trade in SPX and then put on a trade in RUT. Um, it's easy to do. They're both deep and liquid, and uh, sure, I would take a look at that. I would also uh, add, uh, get a hold of Rick Rosenthal to bring an RVX future back into. Uh uh, into the product suite well, at SIBO, please. Well, uh, funny you should mention that because that happens to be our next question here. This comes from Prime. Prime 3, they want to know, very straightforward, very simple, are there any plans to bring back RBX? Seems like a great time to have a product on Russell 2000 volatility. And, you know, we go back to that clip from uh, a few years ago when they first inverted, and it does sound like it's an it's exact replay of what's going on right now. Weakness in China, concerns about the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a copy and paste. So, Rick, maybe, maybe Prime is on to something here, Prime 3. Maybe these are good times. You got any secret unveilings you want to unleash upon us here, sir? It's just three guys in a room talking with microphones. There's, there's no one out there listening. I love it. Um, so, as you know, the index itself is not tradable, but there are futures and options on VIX. Uh, we used to have futures and options on RVX. Uh, we had a primary market maker in uh, both. And because there was a lack of demand, uh, the primary market makers stepped away. So, I would advise anybody that has a strong interest, send me your interest. Um, I'm happy to share it internally at SIBO. If we get enough interest, then I can make the case and bring it back. So I'd love to see that. My email address is rosenthal at SIBO.com. 
take him up on it, listeners. He was he was silly enough to give you his email. So uh, so go uh, hit him up and let him know there is. A, you guys write to us all the time. I wish I wish I could wave my magic wand here in the studio and make these products materialize for you. But guys like Rick, guys like Sean, they they could get it done. So hit them up as well and say, hey, I would like to trade that. This would be a good time and or a fun time and or a profitable time to trade such a thing. And uh, perhaps, you know, never know. Maybe you'll get a surprise. Let's see here. Speaking of surprise, we got, what is this? Jay, Jay Trenery chiming in about the ag moves. And people are talking about how China, Ukraine is trying to fill China's core needs to any place the U.S. He says, thankfully, ag products are fungible. I think he's kind of joking a little bit. Obviously, no one wants to see the U.S. trade here <laughs> replaced overseas. But still, yeah, an interesting point to seeing what's going on in the ag space here. Right now. All right, right back again to Russell. Look at this. No, no rest for the wicked here. Nelly. Nelly wants to know uh, Recon. That's, of course, the big event we've talked about. I don't think any show has ever done a deeper dive into Recon in the history of life, Sean, than this show a couple of weeks ago when we did that, that big data dive into all things Recon. So if you want to know about Recon, listeners, go back a couple of weeks. Sean and I hit pretty much every salient point humanly possible and then a couple of extra on top of it. But Nelly wants to know... Does the big recon, does it have any impact on Russell 2000 volatile? We got this question, I think, a few times when the recon itself was actually happening as well. You guys are the Russell, the Russell professionals here. Uh, maybe who wants it, Sean or, or Rick, or maybe both? You know, in recon, the majority of, of shares that trade uh, to rebalance the, the Russell indices happens at the close of the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. And um, NASDAQ in particular has uh, an ability to use what's called the closing cross. So within the last second, last second and a quarter of the trading day, these billions of shares tra- uh, trade. And uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a vol trade whatsoever. It doesn't make the market swing at all because it's uh, um, a, literally a closing transaction at the bell. Excellent question, Ellie. Thank you for asking. The reality is, um, unlike the S&P, Russell um, reconstitutes their indexes once a year. And there's a process that takes place that goes over a period of months. And there's a telegraphing of what uh, candidates are likely to be moved from the 1,000 down to 2,000 or 2,000 up to 1,000. There's a, a banding between the two. So there's a, an indication of um, how much change will take place. And uh, actually, the Russell Recon, if I'm not if – you might uh, correct me, Sean. It's one of the biggest trading days of the year. I mean, it's, it's – The highest, highest volume trading day on, on, our, on the stock exchange is correct. So, and it breaks records. It, it has consecutively for the last few years broken the volume records. So we look at this year after year because we're, we're trying to see if, if there is any kind of opportunity to trade vol going into recon or afterwards. And what we found is that it's essentially a non-event. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to say, yeah, there's, there's some great vol going into it. But really, you guys do such a great job managing the reconstitution that uh, it causes minimal impact, if any, to the marketplace. Yeah, you know, I think I, 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 you know, I think I can concur with that. We talked about it a lot here on the show. Obviously, there were other there were other macro trends going on during recon. Sometimes it's hard to parse what's trade war vol from what's recon driven. But I, I don't think it's an accident that recon was constructed the way it is. You know, spread out over this extensive period of time, like you mentioned, Rick, telegraphing all the key changes ahead of time, and then the actual event happening like that. You know, like like a, with a snap of the fingers after the bell, pretty much. All of that is designed to do just that to minimize. This I, I suppose you could do the opposite. Maybe for Nelly, Sean, maybe you need to change it. Maybe you need to have it happen all in one day without any advance notice. That that might do it. That might get us a little vol. What do you think, Sean? That would definitely bring vol. Uh, but as we've uh, mentioned, that this uh, reconstitution is kind of designed to kind of take that volatility out so that investors know where they're getting in to in, in out of the various transactions. Um, you know, June's also a... Uh, Historically low vol month, but you know in the last couple of years volatility has actually been high uh, during this. But we've found that with the technology in place to cross these uh, transactions on the bell, that we uh, uh, we benefit from that transaction and not having that 
uh, slippage or uh, price movement uh, with these transactions, which is, is truly a benefit to the investor community. Yeah, you might think you want a lot of vol around this event, but trust me, Nelly, I don't think you want what what would happen if all of this just hit willy nilly uh, on a random day. That would be that would be. I think the regulators might have a, might have a thing or two to say about <laughs> something something like that as well. So yeah, no, I think there's the short answer and the longer answer is that's that's pretty much by design there, Nelly. All right, we'll wrap it up with this one. This kind of comes in what we we're hitting on before. This is from TLTT. I don't know, Sean, nothing I can. Just tilts. Nothing exciting on that acronym, unfortunately. There's no in the money. In the money, Tim might win this week for the uh, our, our acronym of the week here. He just wants to know: Have you seen any more love to WTI skew given the recent price rally? Where I kind of just broke that down earlier, and the moral of the story was a little bit, a little bit more than what we saw last week. But there's nothing. Uh, people keep writing in looking for you know the indicator that says the worm has turned on WTI. That everyone is now extremely bullish to the upside, and we're going to have a protracted move to the upside in WTI land. And we just not seeing that yet. It's it's continually weak. It's week week after week. We've had the market makers in here telling us exactly that, that anytime there's any upside move, they just use that as an excuse to dump more calls and weaken that call wing eh, even further. So I, unfortunately, if you're, it sounds like you're a bit of a crude bull, I had nothing, nothing to tell you on that front that might cheer you up. Uh, if, when that changes, we'll be the first to let you know. We're the ones out there living and dying and analyzing that WTI skew week to week. But for now, it doesn't seem like anything is indicating any sort of long-term reversion with the weakness in global eco- economic demand, weakness in China. It doesn't seem like anything's – unless the tensions in the Middle East heat up <laughs> quite a bit and the supply situation changes markedly in the U.S., that could do it. But we don't see any hints of anything, at least right now, on the skew front that's going to, uh, to change things markedly in the near future. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we've come to the end of another epic journey through the world of Twyfo. We talked a lot of Russell, all things Russell. Uh, crazy time in Russell Vol. A lot of equities, hit a little bit of WTI, a little bit of eggs, a little bit of corn, and then some of your other questions about um, skew and a million questions about Russell because you guys clearly have a bunch. Uh, but Rick, before we go, let's. Uh, you're our guest. We'll give you pride of place. You kind of you already gave your your email, so be prepared for that. But outside of that, uh, maybe you want to leave our audience a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease. Maybe the return of a beloved product called RBX. Now is the time, sir. The uh, the floor is yours. What I'd like to do is uh, point out, take a look at a graph of the large cap versus small cap. Um, it is really interesting because it's one of the uh, widest divergences we've seen in, in recent times. So for those who um, like to uh, look at um, a spread opportunity, now is a good time. Take a look at uh, SPX or S, you know, however you want to express it, S&P versus uh, Russell um, there's an opportunity to, to take advantage of, of that di- that divergence, and also just uh, just overwhelm you with questions and inquiries about when RBX is coming back as well, right? That's also you'll be expecting that on your email forthwith here. Uh, uh, send me <laughs> send me your demand emails. It's, uh, it's Rosenthal R O S E N T H A L at cbo And uh, Sean, same question for you. You're out there fighting the good fight on all things Russell. What's Coming down the pike, what can we expect? What can we look forward to? And maybe if you want to learn more about what you're working on, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Um, S. Smith at FTSERussell.com. If you want to send the comments to me, sometimes you, you want to send it to the index provider and not the exchange. I'm here for that uh, client input as well. But uh, Rosenthal at SIBO.com. Let's, uh, let's bring that RVX uh, contract back. I'm excited because there's a tremendous opportunity here for that, that uh, volatility trade. And uh, – I look forward to that. There you go. Bring back RBX. That should be our hashtag every episode of this show. Bring back RBX. We want it. The audience wants it. They want to trade it. It drives product. It drives volume. All these other products we're talking about now as a result. All these other equities, you want to trade the ball against it. Bring it back in RBX would help do that. So there you go. Deluge. Deluge Rick with your hashtag bring back RBX comments. Of course, if you want to kick the tires and light the fires for yourself, play along the home game of the show, seemegroup.com. Slash Twifo is the place to go. You can check out all the reports, do the analysis. If you want to upgrade to the pro version, bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com, or quickstrike, Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E.net are the places to go. And on behalf of Rick and Sean, let's throw our old boy Nick out there who's on on his summertime assignment. Should be back next week. And our friends at CME. And indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in so many great questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next week for more 
of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 